everyone for coming tonight to our spring 2014 installment of our last lecture series. Um, this evening is my privilege to introduce to you all a very special guest tonight. Um, he was born and raised in Minnesota, uh, and when it looks like I'm here scrolling, it's because all his credentials don't fit on one nice neat page. <laughs> <laughs> um, he received his uh, bachelor's in classics from St. Olaf College in 1980, um, and moved on to receive a PhD in classical philosophy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1986. He's taught in North Carolina, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and has now moved here to Virginia Tech in 1992. Um, over his time teaching, he's won several awards, most notably the Diggs Teaching Scholar Award in 1997, the Scorn Award for Excellence in Teaching Introductory Subjects in 2000, and his most recent award, the Outstanding Advising Award from the National Associ Academic Advising Association. Um, in 2008, he became the Director of Honors here at Virginia Tech, um, and now after six years of serving us very, very well, um, he will be moving on next year to become the Dean of the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee. So would you all please put your hands together for Dr. Terry Pathmark. Thank you. This was nice, I appreciate this. <laughs> uh, thank you, Andrew. Where did Andrew, oh there is Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I need to make one important correction. It's St. Olaf College, not St. Olaf's College. It's very important, St. Olaf College. <laughs> yeah, I sure you betcha. <laughs> um, so I was thinking, um, some of you know this book, some of you don't. It's called Teaching Excellence at a Research-Centered University. And this was published, actually I don't remember when it was published, um, 2007. Um, and this includes um, chapters by a number of faculty around this university about what it means to do good teaching at a big university. And I thought um, that I would just read my chapter. Um, I thought that would be just easier. Uh, <laughs> and because it's not, it's, I still believe it, amazingly enough. You don't always believe everything you publish 10 years after you published it, but I actually still believe this. Um, but I won't do that. But I do encourage you to take a look at this book. Um, there's, a nice, uh, there's a nice chapter by Jack Dudley, for example. And there's a chapter by Art Baikema and Joe Pitt and Tom Gardner and just about Paul Heilker um, and just about everybody that's, uh, everybody that's anybody is in, is in that book. Um, so <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, there's a lot of familiar faces here. Um, and I'm grateful for that. So, um, now most of you know me, um, and you probably know um, at least these three things about me. Um, first, uh, I am a person of the book. Um, I like to read, I like texts, and so I am gonna read to you some tonight. Um, and not out of that one, but out of these. including uh, my edition of Virgil, uh, edited by Papillon. This is, this is one of the reasons I'm a classicist today, is I was walking through the library looking for a book on Virgil, and I found this book, Virgil, by Papillon. And then I opened it up, and I thought, my God, what is this? It's a sign. And I opened it up, and it's by T.L. Papillon. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and so I just, you know, I had no choice at that point. I, um, in fact, I might have been, still been a math major when I, no, I think I was a music major when I found this. <laughs> um, Thomas Leslie, he was a British cleric uh, and classicist, and this was published in 1882. Um, so, but it's a good, it's a good text, it's a good text. Um, though, actually, I don't know that I will use it now that I think about it. Um, all right, so I will read to you some uh, this evening. Um, you also know that I'm a classicist, um, and I'm very happy to be a classicist, and so, the majority of what I will be reading tonight from texts will be from classical texts. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, move that, move that, put that there, put that there. All right, very good. Um, put that there. Okay. Um, third, you know that I cry at the drop of a hat. Um, <laughs> and so I will probably, you know, continue the pattern that's been pretty regular this week. Um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, now it's Thursday. Um, 
Um, and I'm going to show you the first classical text that ever made me cry, um, because it's one of the main reasons I'm a classicist. Um, so, um, and remember, you don't lose man points for crying. Um, I want to focus on a classical myth. Um, I want to focus on the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, um, a romantic, tragic tale of love, faith, and lost love, of talent and passion and misdirected passion. So tonight, I thought we might entitle this Faith, Hope, and Love, These Three, and Anger. <laughs> now, I, I suspect that, that many of you will recognize the first part of that anyway um, as a quotation, um, a quotation, not a quote. Quote is a verb, quotation is a noun. Right? Um, as a quotation from the Christian Bible. Uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, and I wanted to uh, give you the larger context of that. Um, and this is uh, verses 9 through 13. Uh, For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways, mostly. Um, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been known fully. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Um, now, let me digress for a moment. What a surprise. Um, I am kind of known for digressing. Um, and I want to point out that St. Paul expects to understand fully only at the end, when he sees Christ face to face. He understands the difficulty of knowing. And he understands the difficulty of knowing while we're on this earth. That idea always makes me less arrogant about my claims and more willing to listen to possibilities. And it's important to listen. Um, you do not have the right to disagree with someone until you understand what it is they're saying. To do otherwise is ignorance or arrogance important to listen. And I don't want you to think of this as a digression. Um, I actually believe that digressions are always connected. Um, everything is connected and everything is developmental. So there might be some digressions, who knows. But think of them rather as, um, <clears throat> as a footnote, right? Um, additional information, <clears throat> excuse me, additional important information uh, that does not quite fit into the flow of the argument, but it's important nonetheless, right? I love footnotes. Um, as a classicist, classicists love footnotes, and my goal is always to have the footnotes larger than the text on the page above it. Um, so, so I want to talk about Orpheus, Eurydice, faith, hope, and love, and anger, um, because all of these are part of what education is all about. You see, I view honors as an act of faith. Um, I found myself using theological language a lot lately um, about honors. Um, when we put, for example, a great faculty member and great uh, honor students together uh, in a colloquium, I don't know what will happen, but I have great faith that it's going to be fabulous. Um, um, and I view education in general as one of the greatest acts of hope the most optimistic, hopeful thing we can do is educate our children. That act implies a better future, an expectation that things are going to continue, and that, those, and that these young people have the ability to create, to improve, and to lead. Few things are more, more hopeful than that. And I see the foundation of what we do here in Honors, at Tech, in the process of education, as about the people involved. Thus, I see it as an act of love. For me, education is about connection, about communication, and about commitment. And that sounds a lot like love to me. Now, let me digress for just a moment um, and point out that the Isocratean triad, um, as it's so called among rhetorical scholars, um, the Isocratean triad includes nature, training, and practice. And this has been a common idea throughout the history of education, um, but it does go back to Isocrates and uh, presentations of it, a guy that I like to spend a fair amount of time with. Um, and I think about these three parts when I think about interacting with students. Um, while we cannot change a student's nature, 
we can often help awaken their true nature by getting them to talk about what they value and where their passions lie. And this often ends up being a very different direction than they had originally planned. Um, and I actually don't have any plans for doing sociometrics tonight, um, but I'm just curious about how many people in this room are majoring in something different than they started with. Um, you don't have to stand up, but raise your hands. Yep, I started off as a mathematician, right? Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering actually about how many people in this room I was part of that conversation. <laughs> um, I've had a number of people lately <laughs> said, you know, you called this when you, when a freshman year when you said, no, you're not going to do that, you're going to do this. Um, and uh, that frightens me a little, actually. <laughs> All right. Um, training, of course, is that necessary leading, um, setting out principles and ideas to chew on. And the practice, practicing. You know, this may be where the faculty contact happens most, right? Helping students go through experiences and then reflecting on them, on what worked or what didn't, what moved them forward. And these are important steps. And they're different for each student. Um, a famous story about Isocrates' uh, work with students tells us how he had to pull in the reins to a very brash student. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to look at you specifically. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long night. Um, yeah, so pull in the reins with a brass student, right, and, and apply the lash, as he phrased it, uh, to, a tim or to the author phrased it, to a timid students, right? And I'm not going to try to look at anybody specifically about that one. Um, and he knew this because he had spent a lot of time with his pupils, right? What each student's nature was, how best to train them, and how best to set them at practice. Nature training, and practice, right? There are many things important in education, but Isocrates was on to something here, and his students wept when they left his school, um, just as I've been weeping this week as I get ready to leave this school. Um, that was, by the way, a reverse simile. Uh, go Google Homeric similes, and, and you can read more about reverse similes. <laughs> so... <laughs> You always have to talk about Homer. You can't ignore Homer. Right? So let me turn to Orpheus and Eurydice, who's not in Homer. Um, <laughs> this is one of the stories that confirmed that I should be a classicist. Um, it was the first Latin text that I wept at, or the first Latin text that made me cry. Um, Orpheus was a Greek mythic character that got then translated, translated into the Latin uh, uh, tradition. He was considered to be the best musician and the best singer in the world. Um, even nature paid attention when he sang. Trees would lean over toward him when he was singing because they wanted to hear him. The birds stopped singing and things like that. Um, he was considered to be the child of Calliope, one of the muses, and Apollo, the god of music. Uh, but Apollo was the god of sort of intellectual highbrow, highbrow music. So think of you know, Bach or Mozart or John Cage or Tumbleweed Stampede. Um, <laughs> if you don't know the latter, you can ask me about that. Um, he fell in love with a young woman, Eurydice. And at their wedding, Things did not go well. Um, Eurydice was assaulted by a man named Aristeus. She ran away from him in fear. And then, well, let me read some Virgil to you. Um, from the last por portion of a poem that's called the Georgics. It is a, uh, a didactic epic poem on farming and life. And it's just a wonderful poem. Um, and I encourage you all, if you haven't um, done anything with, with Virgil's Georgics, to spend some time there. Um, we're in the fourth part of it, talking about bees and beekeeping, right? And he's trying to explain an ancient concept called bugonia. And this comes from the, the Greek word bous, which is bovine character, bovine a animal, and gonia, production. And there's this ancient Roman theory that if all of your bees die, you can regenerate the beehive by killing a cow and letting it rot for many, many days, and then cutting open the carcass and bees will come out, new bees will come out. They didn't have it quite right, but you know, <laughs> given the problem with bees these days, maybe we should try it, right? Um, well, Aristeus' bees had died, and so he's trying to figure out why his bees had died. And he sneaks up on a river god named Proteus, and Proteus tries to explain the, the situation to him. And he explains that his bees, has died, his bees have died because of what he did to Orpheus and Eurydice. Right? So Proteus says, to, uh, um, to Aristeus here at this point. 
And I, and I need to uh, digress for a moment um, and say that um, these stories were well known to the Greeks, well known to the Romans. They knew all these stories. So it wasn't like you know, a surprise in the plot or anything. That wasn't the issue. The issue was how well, how cleverly, how engagingly, is that a word, engagingly? Engagingly? Did you tell the story? Right? Um, and one of the things that Virgil does is he tells his story. He tells it very quickly, and he leaves gaps because they know the story, and he can do that. Right? I'll try to help you with this. But, um, so, um, so Proteus says to Aristeus, um, um, and Orpheus, inconsolable, uh, oh, sorry, his wife, I need to preface this a little bit more. So his wife is attacked by Aristeus. She takes off running across a field, and Aristeus is chasing her. Right? And what she didn't see <clears throat> in the grass, the tall grass, was a snake in the grass. And the snake bites her, and she's poisoned, and she dies. So she's now gone. Right? <clears throat> All right. So, and Orpheus. I can't talk. That's going to be a problem. <clears throat> Orpheus, inconsolable, rages over the loss of his dear wife Eurydice. She fled from you headlong along the river, unhappy maiden, and did not, seek the fright, did not see the frightful snake that lurked in the high grass. This is the locus classicus for snake in the grass, by the way. I um, uh, didn't see him uh, lurked in the high grass guarding the river bank. And then there's a gap because everybody knows that she's bitten by the snake and she dies. The cries of the sister bands of dryads filled the air as high as the mountaintops. The cliffs of Rhodope wept. The cliffs of Panagia wept. And the warrior land of the Gitai, Orthea, Hebrus wept. Alone upon the unfrequented shore, Orpheus, playing his lyre, sang to himself his songs of you, dear wife, as day came on with the light and as the day descended, as the sun descended at evening. Singing, he went down through the very throat of Tynaris. So he decides to go down to the underworld. Right? He's going to try to get her back. Very exciting. Um, he went down to the very throat of Tynaris, the high gate of the dark kingdom of Dis, and through the murky grove where terror dwells in black obscurity. And he entered into the Mane's place, the place of the dreadful king, and the hearts no human prayers can cause to pity. And set in motion by the sound of music from the lowest depth, Orpheus's music. From the lowest depths of Erebus, there came, as numerous as the many hundred birds that, driven by their coming on of an evening or a winter storm, fly in for shelter into floric foliage of a grove. The flittering shades of the underworld, the insubstantial, unsubstantial phantom shapes of those for whom there is not any light at all, women and men, famous great-hearted heroes, the life of their hero bodies now defunct, unmarried boys and girls, sons whom their fathers had had to watch being placed on a funeral pyre. And all around them, the hideous tangling reeds um, and the black ooze of Caucasus, swampy waters. Nine times sticks round its fettering chain around them, and the house of death was spellbound by his music. All the way down to the bottom of Tartarus, spellbound the snakes and the hair of the Furies stood still too. And Cerberus, the three-headed hell, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the three-headed hound of hell, um, uh, the three mouths were open-mouthed and silent, forgetting to bark. The wind was still, and Ixion's wheel stopped turning. So you had this bow to epic narration, and all these great heroes that just pay attention to him singing, right? And there's a gap again. He's successful. And now, as he was carefully going back the way he came, and step by step, avoiding all possible wrong steps, and step by step, Eurydice, whom he was bringing back, unseen behind his back, was following. Right? For this is what Proserpina had commanded. So the king and queen of the underworld said, yes, you can have your bride back. She will follow you back up to the upper world, but you must trust that she's back there, and you must never turn around to look at her until you get to the upper world. Right? They were coming very near the upper air. And a sudden madness seized him. Madness of love, furor, um, Latin, that's the Latin word. A madness to be forgiven, if hell but knew how to forgive. He stopped in his tracks. And then, just as they were about to emerge out into the light, suddenly, seized by love, bewildered into heedlessness, alas, his purpose overcome, he turned and he looked back at Eurydice. And then and there, his labor was spilled and flowed away like water. The implacable tyrant broke the pact, 
Three times the pools of Avernus heard the sound of thunder. What is it, she cried. What madness, Orpheus, was it that has destroyed us, you and me? Oh, look, the cruel fates already call me back, and sleep is covering over my swimming eyes. Farewell, I'm being carried off into the vast surrounding dark and reaching out my strengthless hands to you forevermore. Heo non tua, alas, not yours. And when I got to Heo non tua, I'd never read this work before, and I'm translating through the Latin, and I get to Heo non tua, and I burst into tears. <laughs> alas, no longer yours. Right? Uh, <clears throat> and right then, I knew I had to be a classicist. Right? And saying this, like smoke disintegrating into air, she was dispersed away and vanished from his eyes and never saw him again. And he was, the left has it Latin, and I don't really want to read the Latin to you. <clears throat> except for the Heo non tua. Clutching at shadows, <clears throat> excuse me, I mislaid you there. Um, and he was left clutching at shadows with so much still to say. And the boatman never again would take him across the barrier of the marshy waters of hell. What could he do? His wife twice, twice taken from him. How could he bear it? How could his tears move hell? The Stygian boat had carried her away. So there's a new tragedy. This is a tragic tale of him losing his bride to Aristeus and his snake. And he's got the chance to save her. And then he blows it. And it is said that, that, that he, day after day, for seven months beside the river Strymon, sat underneath a towering cliff and wept and sang and told in song his story. Entranced, entranced the wild beasts listened. Entranced, the oak trees moved closer to hear his song, which was like that of a nightingale in the shade of a poplar tree, in mourning for her children who were taken, as yet unfledged, by a herdsman, heart of heart who had happened upon the nest. She weeps all night and over and over repeats her lamentations for her babies and fills the listening air with her sad complaint. So Orpheus, no thought of marriage or any other love could turn his heart away from his bereavement. Alone he roamed the Hyperborean north and wandered among the snowy banks of the dawn or through the barren frozen fields of the sides of the Ripaean mountains in grief for his lost wife in Hades' empty promise. Until the enraged Siconian Bacchants in a nocturnal ritual orgy, orgy tore his body limb from limb and scattered the pieces everywhere far and wide. And as his head, cut off from his beautiful neck, was tumbling down the rushing course of the river Hebrus, his voice and his tongue, with his last breath, cried out, Eurydice, Eurydice. And the banks of the downward river Hebrus echoed, Eurydice, Eurydice. And that's a Virgil story. Now, um, let me digress for a moment um, and highlight the phrase, in grief for his lost wife and Hades' empty promise. I want to encourage you not to read this as an indictment of Hades. Hades had made a deal, and Orpheus did not keep it. The promise is empty because Orpheus failed, not because Hades was somehow villainous. In life, don't look to assign blame or responsibility to others when you have control over what happens. I think too often in modern days, we try to blame someone else for things that are really in our responsibility. So here's the tale of a man who suffers tragic loss and has it within his power to correct that loss and then who fails. That is, the tragic loss moves from being someone else's fault to being his responsibility. Thus, the story becomes even more tragic. As I say, when I first read those strengthless hands, she reaches out and says, Eo non tua, that's when I burst into tears. There's a sophistication to this narrative, um, such an intentional and effective rhetorical leading of the listener to that point of Eo non tua. Um, this is good writing. And the story ends there, with Orpheus's bereft head crying out in vain. And Virgil stopped there. Because much of his writings emphasize the danger of furor, of madness, and the darkness that can cause. His is a dark, but in, I think, many ways, a very honest view of how we humans often act. And he asks us this, excuse me, he asks us if this is really the way we want to make choices in life. For those of you who know Virgil's Aeneid, know that it ends with Aeneas killing, Hec uh, 
killing. Um, help me out, Virgo people. Um, I can't believe I can't remember who he kills at the end. Um, anyway, he's, he, the poem ends with him in anger, and most people read that as Virgil saying to Augustus, how do you want to be king? Do you want to be angry or do you want to be forethoughtful? How do you make choices in life? What are your values? What are your motivations? What and whom do you love? Where does your passion lie? These are important questions. These are the questions that college should ask if you're getting a good education. College should push you out of your comfort zone. College should offend you if you're getting a good education. And it doesn't matter if you're a classics major or a sociology major, an electrical engineer or a piano performance major. What motivates you? What's your passion? How will you serve? What prosum is the basis of a real and really important question. Orpheus shows us a person of extreme talent, like all of you, who is faced with difficulties, some external, some internal. What will you do? What will you decide? That's important. That's education. Orpheus is a person of talent and passion. Note how Virgil is at pains to show the extremity of his mourning right, on both occasions. Right? He feels things deeply that are important to him. He is a man of passion. Some might say, and I think, rightly I think, that his passions are both his greatest strength and his greatest weakness. How will you address your passions, your talents, your education? Where will you find your motivation? It must be an internal motivation. It must not be externally dictated. So much of what we do, so much of college is externally motivated. But you won't get a real education. You won't become a useful citizen if you do not find that internal motivation for what you're doing. You determine whether you're happy. You determine whether you flourish. Now, we are, most of us, American citizens. And as Americans, we like happy endings. Disney's done that to us. <laughs> um, and so I have one for you. I have a happy ending story. And this comes from Ovid, um, another of Rome's great poets. He tells this same story of Orpheus and Eurydice in his great epic myth textbook, The Metamorphoses. He tells it at great length, Orpheus's travails, and he does not do the little vignettes that Virgil did. He's a great narrator. He's one of the best storytellers ever, Ovid is. Right? But he does it with rhetorical purpose as well. So let me read you the end in Ovid's version. This is from book, the beginning of book 11 of the Metamorphoses. Um, Such were the songs of Orpheus. With these, the Thracian poet charmed the woodland trees, the souls of savage beasts. Even the stones were held in thrall by Orpheus's tender tones. But now the Thracian women all had cast the hides of beasts around their frenzied breasts, down from a high hilltop, spied Orpheus as he attuned his lyre and his sweet voice. And one of these, hair streaming loose behind, beneath uh, light winds, cried out, he's there, the man who dares to scorn us. Remember Virgil said he didn't want to get married again. Um, Through the air, she hurled her staff against Apollo's poet, and it was meant to smash his singing mouth. But since its tip was wreathed with leaves, it left only a glancing mark. It did not do deadly work. At that, another woman cast a stone, but as it cleaved the air, it yielded to the spell of his enchanting voice. It fell at Orpheus' feet as if compelled to seek forgiveness for its mad audacity. I love that line. The stone asking for forgiveness. Uh, but nothing now could check the wild attack. Fanatic fury whips their rage. In truth, the song of Orpheus could have subdued all of their weapons, but his lyre was drowned out by shrieks and caterwauls, the raucous sounds of drums and twisted Beresynthian flutes, Bacchus pounding hands and strident howls, and so at last the stones were stained with blood, the blood of one whose voice could not be heard. Then the Bacchans chose to slaughter first the countless birds, the serpents, and the throng of savage beasts, all who were still spellbound by Orpheus. The trophies he had won, the living proof of his triumphant song. Then, with their gory hands, these women turned to Orpheus himself. They circled him as birds do when they catch sight by day of some nocturnal bird of prey. The poet was like the stag who, in a spectacle, is doomed to die by morning light when dogs surround him in the, bo in the bounds of an arena. He 
you gotta remember, you gotta use similes are using something that you know to figure out what you don't know, right? So they are apparently familiar with dogs attacking animals in the, in the enter for entertainment, right? Great world of Rome. Uh, <laughs> Um, some women rushing at him hurled their staves, their thirsty wreathed with green leaves, hardly meant to serve this purpose. Others cast thick clods, and some flung branches ripped from trunks, while rocks served others. And to stock the armory, the frenzy with uh, true weapons, there nearby, by chance, yoked oxen plowed the soil. And not far from these, well-muscled, sweating peasants toiled. Um, and when these peasants saw the women rush, and when they caught sight of the fanatic crowd, these peasants, fled, these peasants fled at once, and on the ground they left behind their tools. Deserted fields, they left behind their, uh, deserted fields were strewn with mattocks and shovels and hoes, and the women, crazed, notion of fear or of madness, right, uh, rushed off, picked up these tools, and having torn apart the oxen, who had menaced them with their horns, <laughs> such a cute little comment, right, who had menaced them with their horns, um, they hurried back to kill the poet. He, with arms outstretched, for the first time spoke words without effect, and for the first time his voice did not enchant, and they, in desecration, murdered him. And from that mouth, whose speech had even held the stones and savage beasts beneath its spell, the soul with its last breath was driven out. The birds, in mourning, wept. The throngs of savage beasts, I guess the ones that hadn't been killed, um, and rigid stones and forest too. All of these had often followed as you sang. The trees now shed their leafy crowns as signs of grief. Their trunks were bare. They say that even streams were swollen. Yes, the rivers too shed tears. Naiads and dryads fringed their veils with black and left their hair disheveled. Orpheus' limbs lay scattered, strewn about. But in your flow, you, Hebrus, gathered in his head and lyre. And look, a thing of wonder. Once your stream had caught and carried them, the lyre began to sound some mournful notes, and the lifeless tongue, too, murmured mournfully, and the response that echoed from the shores was mournful, too. Borne by your seaward flow, they, they leave their own dear Thracian stream. They're carried to the coast, and there a savage snake attacked the head that had been cast onto the shore, a head still drenched and dripping, damp with spray. But Apollo intervened, just as that snake was set to bite the god, froze, the god froze his spread jaws, converting him to stone just as he was with open mouth. And this is the best part. This is the end. The shade of Orpheus descends beneath the earth. The poet knows each place that he had visited before. And in searching through the fields of pious souls, he finds Eurydice. And there they walk together now. And at times they're side by side. And at times she walks ahead with him behind, and other times it's Orpheus who leads, but without any need to fear, should he turn round to see his own Eurydice. So you have a happy ending. Um, they are united in death and can go and walk wherever they want. A lovely happy ending that pokes a little fun at Virgil, right, and gives you a very fulsome account. Now, if I might digress for a moment, um, ancient rhetoricians said that from the Greek orator Demosthenes, no word could be removed, each one crucial to the presentation. And to the Roman orator Cicero, no word could be added. So full was his description. So too, I think, here. From the account of Virgil, no word could be removed without damage. And to the account of Ovid, no word could be added for its thoroughness. In fact, let me tell you that Ovid's version of the death, which is only seven lines in Virgil, is 84 lines longer than the whole narrative of Virgil. Um, so we have our sweet American ending. Things work out. Now, I will say that I prefer Virgil myself. Um, I think that the human experience is perhaps more complex than the narrative, uh, than the narrative that Ovid gives. But Ovid is such, just such a good storyteller and that it's easy to like both, I think. And it's also, Ovid is a very complex storyteller. Um, I have on many occasions referred to him as sort of a proto-feminist and also, it's a weird word, but a proto-postmodernist. Uh, um, Can you be a proto-postmodernist? Um, the, the way he calls traditional narratives into question. That, that's, that'll be later. I mean, some other time, not tonight. Now, we need to remember that there are two important characters in this myth. Okay? Orpheus, to be sure, but what about Eurydice? Eurydice doesn't get to say much or do much in these stories. 
I don't think either of these stories would pass the Bechtel test. Um, we could think of Eurydice as lamenting her loss, see her wondering what life would have been like without her lover. Perhaps she spoke like that. If that were the case, she might speak like uh, something like one of my favorite Nikki Giovanni poems from my favorite Nikki Giovanni book, Bicycles, Love Poems. She might say something like this, and this is Nikki Giovanni's uh, poem called If Only. It's one of my favorite poems. If I had never been in your arms, never danced that dance, never inhaled your slightly sweaty odor, maybe I could sleep at night. If I had never held your hand, never been so close to the most kissable lips in the universe, never wanted ever so much to rest my tongue in your dimple, maybe I could sleep at night. If I wasn't so curious about whether or not you snore, and when you sleep, do you cuddle your pillow? What you say when you wake up, and if I tickle you, do you heartily laugh? If this enchantment, this bewilderment, Furor? Uh, this longing could cease. If this question I ache to ask could be answered, if only I could stop dreaming of you, maybe I could sleep at night. I love that poem. Um, now, ironically, since, <laughs> since it is Nikki's poem, I think that it's probably what a male would have made her say. Um, and I don't think it's quite right. And I feel really weird saying that with Nikki standing in the back of the room. <laughs> uh, I think she'll forgive me, though. Um, I think she's angry. Very angry. Um, and anger makes people quite eloquent at times. I envision her angry and eloquent. So let me bring in one last text to give us her voice. And this comes not from the ancient world, but from the 20th century world. Uh, this is a poem by H.D. H. D. Um, her name's Hilda Doolittle. She's a 20th century poet, but she always went by H.D. Um, she wrote a terrific poem in the voice of Eurydice. Now, as you, can as you can imagine, Eurydice is angry about what has happened to her. Twice. Right? <laughs> Both of the times out of her control. She has a lot to say, and in a very direct manner. So this is H.D.'s Eurydice. So, you have swept me back, I who could have walked with the live soils above the earth, I who could have swept, slept among the flo live flowers at last. So, for your arrogance and your ruthlessness, I'm swept back where dead lichens drip, dead cinders upon moss of ash. So, for your arrogance, I am broken at last, I who had lived unconscious, who was almost forgot. If you had let me wait, I had grown from listlessness into peace. If you would let me rest with the dead, I had forgot you and the past. So there seems to be something different about the first loss and the second loss, right? Here only flame upon flame and black among the red sparks, streaks of black and light grown colorless. Why did you turn back? What hell should be re inhabited of myself thus swept into nothingness? Why did you turn? Why did you glance back? Why did you hesitate for that moment? Why did you bend your face, caught with the flame of the upper earth above my face? What was it that crossed my face with the light from yours and your glance? What was it in you, you saw in my face, the light of your own face, the fire of your own presence? What had my face to offer but reflex of the earth, hyacinth color, caught from the raw fissure of the rock where the light struck? <clears throat> and the color of azure crocuses, and the bright surface of gold crocuses, and of the wildflowers, swift in the veins of, as lightning and as white. Saffron from the fringe of the earth, wild saffron that is bent over the sharp edge of earth, all the flowers that cut through the earth, all, all the flowers are lost. Everything is lost. Everything is crossed with black, black upon black, and worse than black, this colorless light. If I, could have caught up to, if I could have caught up from the earth the whole of the flowers on the earth, if once I could have breathed into myself the very golden crocuses and the red and the very golden hearts of the first saffron, the whole of the golden mass, the whole of the great fragrance, I could have dared the loss. So, for your arrogance and your ruthlessness, I have lost the earth and the flowers of the earth and the live souls above the earth and you who passed across the light and reached ruthless. You who have been your own light, you who to yourself are presence, you need no presence. 
Yet for all your arrogance and all your glance, I tell you this. Such loss is no loss. Such terror, such coils and strands and pitfalls of blackness, such terror is no loss. Hell is no worse than your earth above the earth. Hell is no worse, no, nor your flowers, nor your veins of light, nor your presence a loss. My hell is no worse than yours, though you pass among the flowers and speak with the spirits above the earth. Against the black, I have more fervor than you and all the splendor of your place. Against the blackness and the stark gray, I have more light. And the flowers, if I should tell you, you would have turned from your... I should tell you, you would turn from your own fit paths toward hell, turning again and glance back. And I would sink into this place even more terrible than this. At least I have the flowers of myself. And my thoughts, no God can take that. I have the fervor of myself for a presence and my own spirit for light. And my spirit with its loss knows this, that those, those small against the black, small against the formless rocks, hell must break before I am lost. Before I am lost, hell must open like a red rose for the dead to pass. There's HD. Now, if I can digress for a moment. Uh, I also want to point out that Ovid actually has a fascinating collection of poems in the voices of females. It's called the Heroides. Um, and it's one of the reasons, actually, I call him a proto-feminist with the ways he plays with those voices. Um, and I think they're ripe for study of how male authors do and do not succeed in representations of female voices. So we all understand Eurydice's anger in this HD poem. She was about to be married and start a life with the most, talent, most interesting man on the earth, uh, most talented man on the planet. Then it was snatched from her, and a second time by her boneheaded partner. But we need to pay close attention to this description of anger. I firmly believe that education requires passion, as I've said. But I also think it needs anger, controlled anger. Not the dementia, not the furor that undid Orpheus, but a controlled rage that causes you to act in a constructive manner. React strongly, then take a breath, then make a plan, and then act. Find your exigence, as we rhetoric people say. Right? Uh, an imperfection marked by urgency, that one thing about which you cannot be silent, and then act. All education is about action. If not now, then later. And remember, this is a classicist saying this. All education is about action. Some things you can do now, some things you are getting an education for, so you can change the world once you're out. Um, and yet another digression. I've long admired our motto at Prosum, but I think too many people trivialize it. I think they think that the point is you should just go to a soup kitchen or participate in the big event. Um, not that working in a soup kitchen or doing the big event isn't good. I fully encourage you to do that. It's a fine thing to do. Don't get me wrong. But I really believe the point of the, our university motto is that we are getting an education. We are training ourselves. We are preparing ourselves to be of service with our careers. So act now to be sure. But remember that your service is your career. It's what you do with your life after tech. It's how you work out your values over the next 50 years. Now, I could have talked today about Homer. I can always talk about Homer. Um, I could have talked about how Achilles felt anger. And I could talk about his mainus. Um, that, by the way, was for the, uh, the spring uh, 2014 PGS students. We went to Troy together, and I, they really got into the word mainus. Right? Um, and for that Greek class that I drastically injured myself in trying to explain the word manus without words. Um, Wes was in that one. <laughs> Achilles used his anger for, for motivation. First, it was external motivation of anger against that jerk Agamemnon. Later, the internal motivation came from his love for Patroclus. But there is anger in the Orpheus and Eurydice story, too. It's just that ancient male authors ignored that part. It took a 20th century feminist poet to point that out to us and point out the value of such anger. Notice how her anger compels her to become stronger, more focused, and I would claim ultimately bigger than Orpheus. 
this is a good use of Manus. So I'm not going to end with anger, because I don't think we should end with anger, ever. We use it, but we become something different, something better. We use it to return to hope, to faith, and to love. Because those are the great internal motivators. That is what we should strive for as we look to the questions of what we value and why we act. I have experienced great faith in university honors. I have great hope for the future of honors education here at Virginia Tech. And I have great and abiding love for the students, faculty, and staff of this program that I love. That's why the process of leaving here is so very difficult. That's why I cry. <laughs> and that's a very good thing. And I will have great anger. To quote Jack Dudley six years ago, if I come back here five years from now and the program has not changed and grown, that's your job. That's your responsibility. I'm going to guilt you into it. Okay? You need to take care of this place. You all are fabulous. And you've made yourselves very, very interesting. And for that, I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs>